I'm so grateful for our worship team uh, that every week come and lead us into a time of praise and worship of our Lord. And I'm grateful for our tech team and all the work that they all put in. Um, so bless the Lord. I'm most of all grateful for a Savior who's worth worshiping and, who's worth, and who is worthy of our praise. Thank you for being here today. Uh, if you're joining us online, uh, welcome to Brookhaven Church. Uh, we're delighted that you've joined with us on our live stream, or maybe you're watching later in the week, recorded. So uh, we're delighted to have you join with us today. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking on the subject of hearing from the living Lord, hearing from Jesus Christ, because he wants to talk to you. In fact, it ought to be the normal experience of every child of God that you should be hearing the Lord talking and speaking to you. That should be sort of common. In fact, Jesus described his relationship with his people in John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. He's our shepherd and he goes before us and he speaks to us and we follow his voice. And that should be the normal experience of every child of God. But in reality, many of us who are followers of Jesus would admit that we sort of struggle with knowing the voice of God. We struggle with whether or not it's God talking to us. We aren't sure. Sometimes we doubt whether or not God really still talks today, or can you be sure that he's talking to you? We almost feel like it's arrogant should we say something like, well, the Lord spoke to me and the Lord told me to do such and such. We almost feel like this being somehow uh, presumptuous. And yet, the Bible teaches that that really ought to be the natural, normal experience of every child of God. Being a Christian is about a relationship, literally a relationship with our living Lord, with Jesus Christ. Relationships are all based on consistent communication. Jesus wants to talk to you and me. When Jesus was here in this world for during his ministry of about three and a half years, Jesus had come, according to John chapter one, one of the reasons he came was to explain to us what God, the unseen God was like. So it says in, in John chapter 1, I believe verse 18, where it says, and the one and only son, he has explained or expounded or exegeted God, the unseen God, so we could know what God was like. The night Jesus is, is going to be betrayed and the next day he's going to die, he prays to the Father in John 17, and he says, Father, I have revealed to them everything you wanted me to. In other words, I've told them everything you told me to say. But on that same night, in John 16, he had said to his disciples, I have so much more I want to say to you, but you can't bear it now. You can't understand it now. You can't grasp it now. You can't get a handle on it now, but when the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit comes, he will explain it to you. He will begin to tell you the things that I want to tell you now, but you can't understand. But when he comes, you'll be able to understand it. He'll help you do that. All these many things that I want to say to you now, I'll be able to say to you then through the spirit. And then Jesus said, now the spirit won't speak on his own initiative. He's going to tell you what I say to him that I want you to know. In other words, all these things, I have so much more I want to say to you. I'm going to say it to you after the Spirit comes, but I'm going to say it to him. He's going to live inside of you, and he's going to tell you. So our living Lord speaks to us, speaks to his people by his Spirit who lives within us. And every child of God has the Spirit of God. In fact, Romans chapter 8 says that if you do not have the Spirit of God, you are not a child of God. 
So Jesus told us in John 16 that one of the reasons why he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us is so that we might know the things he wants us to know. So if the Holy Spirit lives in you, and he does if you're a child of God, he's there. One of the reasons he's there is because Jesus wanted him to be there so he could communicate with you. And the Spirit of God in you is the guarantee that Jesus wants to talk to you. He wants to communicate with you. So the Lord, our living Lord, speaks to us by his Spirit who lives within us. And last week, we talked about how the Holy Spirit in us speaks consistently and most commonly through the Scriptures, through the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. He wrote the Bible. And every time you read the Scriptures, you are in the presence of the author. So as you're reading it, you can talk to him. You could say, Holy Spirit, what, what did you mean by that? Holy Spirit, what teacher, show me how this applies to my life. How does this apply to the situation that I'm in? And you talk to him and you depend upon him to do what Jesus sent him to do, which is to communicate to you. And he does that consistently through the scriptures. And if you neglect the scriptures, then you are neglecting the primary way and the most consistent way that he speaks to you. However, it's not the only way the Spirit of God speaks to you. The Spirit of God will speak to you in other ways as well, and I want to talk to you about one of those ways this week, and I want to talk to you about some more ways he speaks next week and how you can know it's him. You've got to be able to learn to recognize the voice of God. The better you get to know him, the more easily you will recognize his voice. I think about when I was growing up, I was a child, a kid, and I would play organized sports. I can remember particularly playing baseball in the Little League parks there in my hometown. And we would go to play in the baseball and, and uh, you know, the, fan, the, the stands, uh, bleachers there would be filled with people. And they'd all be shouting and maybe I'd come up to bat and people are shouting and they're hollering, you know, strike him out or whatever they're hollering. And, and I would just, I just tuned all that out. It's like they weren't even saying anything. But my dad could be sitting in the bleachers and my dad could simply in his normal voice goes, keep your eye on the ball, son. And I'd just pick it up like that. I'd hear his voice right out of the noise. Why? Because I was very familiar with his voice. Because I was familiar with his voice, I could pick it up in the, in the crowds. The more you get to know Jesus, the more easily you recognize his voice. And one of the ways he speaks to you, his voice, is through your desires of your heart. He speaks to you through the scriptures, but he also speaks to you through the desires of your heart. Now, for some reason, for much of my life as a Christian, I somehow had this idea that if I desired to do something, it couldn't possibly be the will of God. I, saw, I had this attitude or this idea that the Christian life was really that you never did what you wanted to do, that the Christian life was a life devoted to doing what you don't want to do. I had this attitude or this idea is a better way to say it. I had this idea, this presumption, presumption upon God that somehow the will of God was always the opposite of what I would want. That my life was to be a life of just such denial of myself, which the Bible tells us to deny yourself, but I thought it meant that to deny myself and therefore I would never be able to do what I wanted to do, would always be doing something God wanted me to do that I, I wouldn't really want to do on my own, but I'm doing it for you, Jesus. I had this attitude that if, if there was two options out here, and option A is something I would love to do. I just feel, I just feel like, boy, that would be 
man, make me feel so fulfilled. And then option B over here is something I think it would be boring. I think it would be laborious. I, I just can't even imagine doing it. I just assumed the will of God was probably B. That is not what the te scriptures teach. In Philippians chapter 2, in verse 13, the Bible says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God is working in you by his spirit who's in you. So God is at work in you by his Holy Spirit to give you the desire to do what pleases him. One of the ways God speaks to you and directs you and guides you is by giving you the desires he wants you to have. God has desires. He has things he wants done. He has things he wants you to do. And God will put that desire in your heart. He works in you to bring that to pass. Then he gives you the power to do it. So he gives you the desire and then the power to bring it to pass. So God will speak and guide you through the desires of your heart. However, you and I have more than one set of desires. The desires of our heart, are it's not only God. There's another set of desires. We're told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, or walk in dependence and obedience to the Holy Spirit, and you will not gratify or satisfy the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. These two sets of desires are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. So there's conflicting desires. We have two different sets of desires in us. One set is from our old flesh, that old part of us that just still has this principle of sin in us. This part of us, there's still part of us that really wants to do what we want to do and not what God wants us to do. We all, we all fight that, right? We have a set of desires that is attracted to the, to the things of this world, that is attracted to sin, disobedience to God. But then there's part of us, we get a new heart when we become a child of God. And we get a new set of desires. There's part of us that wants to do what God wants us to do. And these two sets of desires are in conflict with each other. And if you're a child of God, you sense that conflict. Ironically, for, for many of us, because we are in conflict, because we have this battle is so strong of two sets of desires, we question sometimes if we could even be saved. How could I have such a battle going on in me if I was really a child of God? How could I have such desires sometimes that are just so ungodly? If I was really a child of God, I really wouldn't have such conflict. But the Bible says the opposite. You see, if you weren't a child of God, you wouldn't have a conflict. You don't have one set of desires. That's just to do what you want to do. But when you give your heart to Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, you get a new heart and you get a new set of desires. Now the conflict begins between the desires that God gives you and the desires of your old flesh. And so if you are having that conflict today, rather than that meaning you're not a child of God, that's actually an indication that you are. And the Bible tells us in those verses, another message, but if you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the old flesh. But I want you to see you do have two sets of desires. And God does speak to you through the, your desires. But for years, I just assumed that every desire I had couldn't possibly be God. And what I want you to get, first of all today, is that some of the desires that you have are God. Some of the desires in your heart it's something God is putting there because he wants you to do it. 
And if you throw out all your desires and assume that none of them are God, then you're going to miss the voice of God. So God speaks to you by his spirit by giving you the desire he wants you to have, the desires that please him. So how, how do you know? How can you recognize which set of desires is God? Well, it begins by surrender to the Lord. I mean, it starts with you yielding yourself completely to him. About 90% of the struggle of discerning God's will and God's voice is coming to a point where you say, God, whatever you want. Not what I will, but what you will. Not what I want, what do you want? Most of us wrestle there because we, we, really, we really want to talk God into doing what we want to do. But when you come to God with a heart surrendered to him, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Now, what do you want me to do? It starts with yieldedness and surrender. And when you do that, then the Spirit of God begins to work in you to create in you the desire he wants you to have. But it starts with yieldedness to him. In John chapter, uh, J- chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. See the word wish there? That's the word desire. Ask whatever you desire, and it will be done for you. How in the world could Jesus say that? Ask whatever you desire, and I'll do it? How could you, how could that possibly be true? Because he knows that if you remain in him, so you're in fellowship with him, you are in this dependent relationship. So he's he's giving the analogy in John 15 of the vine and the branches. And he says, just like a branch can do nothing apart from the vine, a branch derives its life from the vine. A branch derives its fruit-giving power from the vine. So the branch has to depend upon the vine. And he said, so you have to depend upon me. You can do nothing without me. If you will live in this dependency upon me, this surrender, this yieldedness to me, this dependency upon my spirit, then if you do that, if you abide in me or remain in me in dependence upon me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and whatever you desire because I will be working on you to create in you the desire I want you to have. So it starts with surrender and dependence upon the Lord. Some of you are trying to make decisions right now in your life, and you're, you're trying to figure out which way should you go, what should you do. It starts with saying, Lord, whatever you want, I surrender this to you. Your will be done. Now show me what your will is, and in advance, I'm making up my mind to do it, whatever you tell me. And so when you start with that dependency, Then second of all, the Spirit of God in you uses the Word of God to create in you the desire of God. So Jesus said, if my words remain in you, ask whatever you desire. So what happens is the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to create in you a desire, the desires of God. So how, Philippians 2, 13, God is at work in you to create a new desire. How does he do that? The Holy Spirit uses the word of God. So when a child of God is surrendered to God and then seeking God in his word, the spirit of God uses the word of God to create in you the desires of God. Because that's how we're wired. That's how God made human beings. You see, whatever we think about affects how we feel. It affects our desires. Have you ever seen a, maybe a a picture of just this luscious looking dessert? 
you weren't even thinking about a dessert. You weren't even having any desire for dessert. All of a sudden, you see this unbelievable looking apple pie with ice cream, or you see a chocolate cake or something, and you start thinking about that dessert. Next thing you know, your mouth's watering, and now you've got a craving and a desire for just some dessert. That's just how we're created. What we, what we focus our attention on creates in us desires. That's why, for example, um, you can go and maybe you're just out, not really at the market for a new car, but you go and you sit in a new car. Smell that new car smell. It looks so shiny and pretty. You look over at that old rattle trap you drove to the car lot. You think, I don't know how I, that thing probably won't even make it home. I've got to have a new car, right? You, you have, it creates in you a desire. You, you didn't necessarily have a desire prior to it, but you start thinking about it, experiencing. Next thing you know, you got a desire. You ever go to a pet store for fun, walk in, see a puppy? You didn't go there wanting a puppy, but boy, you want a puppy now that you're looking at that new puppy, right? It creates a desire. That's why, for example, you can have a dream. And you dream about something, and all of a sudden you wake up, and you've got feelings. You've got an emotion. And you instantly realize it's not real, but you still feel like it's real, right? Because you're wired in such a way that whatever you're thinking about affects how you feel. You've heard this illustration before, but if I said to you right now, don't move, there's a rattlesnake under your feet. If you thought that was so, you'd have an emotion, wouldn't you? And you'd take an action. You'd either freeze or you'd jump right straight up. Now, it wouldn't matter if there was really a snake there or not. If you thought there was a snake there, you'd feel just like it was. And if I said to you, don't move, there's a snake under your feet, and there really was a snake there, but you didn't believe me, and you didn't think it was true, you wouldn't feel any different. So your emotions and your desires are not telling you what's truth. They're telling you what you're focused on, what you're thinking about at the moment. So when you and I are wanting to know what God wants us to do, if we will get alone with God, surrender to the Spirit of God, whatever you want, your will be done, and then get in God's Word and start thinking about His Word, the Spirit of God will use the Word of God to create in you the desires of God for you. Now, how do you know when, I mean, you've got two sets of desires. One of these sets, one of, this, one of these desires is God, one of these desires is you, and how do you tell the difference? How do you keep from getting deceived and and fooling yourself, because I'm really good at convincing myself that something could be God's will when it's really just me. So how do you know the difference? Let me give you three tests. The first one is that when it's a God-given desire, it will never contradict God's Word. The Spirit of God wrote the Word of God, so He is never, ever, ever going to give you a desire that will contradict what he says in his word. Mark that down. If the Bible forbids something, but you have a desire for that, then you can know that desire is from your old flesh. If the Bible commands something, but you have a desire for that, you can know that desire is from the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God will never lead you, speak to you, and give you a desire to do something that's contrary to what he's revealed in his word. You see, we, we need specific guidance from God because God speaks to us through his word, but sometimes we have decisions to make that, that we need specific guidance. Maybe let's say that you're trying to decide between two job openings. And, and you don't know which one, God, which one do you have? Maybe both of them are, as far as you know, line up with principles of God's word, would not be in a violation of God's word. How do you know which one? 
Well, God, through your, his spirit, will give you a desire for the one he wants you to have. If you'll spend time with him, yielded, seek him in his word, he will put his desire in your heart. But it will never contradict his word. As, as obvious as that sounds, you would be amazed at how often I've heard Christians through the years. When, For example, I, I can think of a number of times when people have come up to me and they were, it was a, a believer, a child of God, and they had decided to marry someone who was an unbeliever and not a child of God. And I would show them a passage of scripture that says, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Believers and unbelievers have nothing in common. We don't serve the same Lord. You don't have the same value. You don't have the same priorities. You don't have the commonality with which to live and have a marriage together. So the Bible says for a believer not to marry an unbeliever. And I've said that to people and I've heard them say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I've prayed about it, and I just believe God wants me to do this. No. He will never lead you to do something that would contradict his word. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person or associate with someone who's easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. So a biblical principle says, if you're dating somebody and they got a hot temper, they're easily angered, then the word of God would say, you need to get away from that person. But people will go, oh, I know, but I just love him. And I just, I just, I've prayed about this and I just believe that this is what God wants for me. Never will the Spirit of God give you a desire to do something he's telling you not to do in his word, okay? So you can always test your desires. Now, sometimes, in fact, many times, there's nothing wrong with this. Let's say you're trying to decide about a house you're, you're going to buy. And, and it's, not a, it's not a right or wrong. I've got a couple of houses here. Which one is the right one? So there's not biblical principle that would necessarily guide you in that. Well, then one of the ways God will guide you is through desires of your heart. Would you get alone with him? Say, Lord, your will be done. You know me better than I know myself. You know the future. You know what I need. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And then you seek God in his word, and he will begin to put the desire he wants you to have in, in your heart. Now, if it's God, and it's the spirit of God, it will... It will line up with biblical principles. It won't violate principles. And second of all, the closer you draw to God, the stronger the desire will get. It's sort of like a, a fireplace where the fire is at. The closer you get to it, the hotter and more intense it becomes. God is the one with the desire. It's Philippians 2.13 says God works in you to create in you the desire and then the power to bring about what pleases him. So you see, God desires this for you. So he puts it in your heart to do and desire what he desires. So the closer you draw to him, the more intense, the stronger the desire will become. And the opposite is true. If the desire is not for, from him, the closer you draw to him, the less you will desire it. So if it's a desire that's God-given, it will grow more intense as you seek the Lord. Second of all, if it's a God-given desire, it has staying power. It's not fleeting. It will, it will stay there. Now, it may vary in intensity depending upon how closely you're walking with the Lord, but it won't go away. It'll just stay there. It's, it's always there. It's, and, and, and you'll find yourself maybe times not even really thinking about it, but now you spend a time with God and you have a wonderful time with the Lord, and all of a sudden you have this, this desire for that. It's stronger again. Because the closer you draw to it, 
The more intense it becomes, the closer you draw to God, the more intense it becomes. And it has staying power when it's God. He doesn't change his mind. I remember when I guess the first time in my life that I can think back and be so and definitive about it, when, when I was about 20 years old. When I was 18 years old, I had since God calling me to the ministry, calling me to preach, and I entered the ministry thinking, having a desire to be an evangelist. And so I thought that my ministry was going to be going around from church to church, doing revivals, preaching at different places in this itinerant type of ministry. So I did that for about two and a half years. Almost every week, probably three out of four weeks, I would get a call from a church and they would ask me to come and and speak at the church and I would do that. And that went on for two and a half years. But during that two and a half years, my desire began to change. Suddenly I became less convinced that this was what I wanted to do. It, It was... I didn't feel fulfilled in that because I would go to a church, preach, and then I never knew what happened. I might give an invitation, maybe somebody walked forward. But when I left, I never went back. I didn't know if there was any real change in their life. I never got to see that. So I began to have this growing, changing desire that maybe, maybe I would be happier if I could be in one place where I could see God working in people's lives over time. So I have this growing desire. Now, I don't know at this point that this is God. I just have this sort of, my heart's changing. And so as I'm beginning to entertain thoughts, well, maybe I should be a pastor. One day the phone rings in a church about 10 miles from my mom and dad's house where I lived. They called and said, would you come preach for us Sunday? They said, that's a big, it's a big Sunday for us. It's uh, Father's Day, and it's a, we're having a, a homecoming celebration where we've invited people who grew up in the church and everybody to come back, and we're also having a note-burning celebration. We're going to pay off the building, and we're going to burn the note, and it's a big, big celebration. So would you be our guest speaker? I said, absolutely, and I get there that day, and there's 20 people there. And I am not exaggerating when I say to you, I'm 20 years old, and I'm telling you, everybody there was in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and two ladies, 104. And I'm 20 years old. I don't even think there was a piano player that day. They sang one song a cappella, and then they said, now, Brother Meredith, the service is yours. And I got up to speak. And I remember leaving there that day going, okay, I've been thinking about being a pastor. Boy, there's no way I'd ever pastor a church like this. That week they called and they said, would you consider being our pastor? And I remember thinking to myself, no way. Now, I didn't say that. That wouldn't have sounded real spiritual. So I didn't say that. But I said, well, let me pray about it. You know, I didn't even really, I, I thought well, there's no way God would want me to do that. I'm 20 years old. I, have, I can't relate to these people. There's no teenagers. There's no young people. There's no young families. There's no, so there's no way I'm, God wants me to do that. So I don't even think I prayed about it for the first several days because I was just so certain this couldn't possibly be God. But about the middle of the week, I decided, well, I guess I ought to check in with God and just let him confirm what I already know. So I started praying about it about the middle of the week. And all of a sudden, as I began to seek the Lord and say, God, I want your will to be done and and began to seek him and get in his word, I went from no way to sort of neutral. And I thought, that's strange. So then I called the folks and I said, look, could I have another week to pray about this? They said, sure. So then I got serious. And I started seeking the Lord, saying, God, your will be done, and whatever you want, and praying, see. And I went from no way to I really wanted to do this in about two weeks. Now, at the time, I didn't know this is how God works. So I'm sitting there going, how do I know which one of these? Is this me? Is this just my old flesh wanting to do this for some reason? I can't imagine why, but I 
Could it be? Maybe it's prideful. Maybe it's, I, I'm thinking about all these things. So I remember I gave God a, a sign. I said, Lord, if, if this is your will, I wouldn't recommend this, but I said this. He, he, he put up with my immaturity. I said, God, I, I, I think this is your will. I'm going to accept that church Sunday unless you let this happen. And if this certain thing happens, I'll know that you don't want me to do it. But if it doesn't happen, then I'm going to accept that church. And if I make a mistake, it's your fault. And so it didn't happen. And by faith, I accepted that church because I wanted to. And it turned out to be about four and a half of the sweetest years of my life. Those sweet folks loved me. They adopted me like their grandson. And I'm telling you, it was just a precious, precious experience. And God blessed and We had children and we had youth and God brought young folks and, and God did an amazing thing through those dear, precious, precious saints. But God changed my heart. He began to put in my heart what he wanted when I got alone with him, said, not my will, your will. I began to get in his word, seek him, that he put his desire for me in my heart. He'll do that for you. He wants to do that for you. So one of the ways God speaks is through the desires of your heart. Psalm 37.4 says, delight, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So in other words, put God first. Make him the focus of your life. Take joy in him. And if you do that, he will give you the desires of your heart because he will work on you to create in you the desires that please him. I want you to bow your heads. Maybe you're here and you're a child of God or maybe you're watching right now and you're a child of God and you are wrestling with a decision. There's something, a decision you have to make and, and you want to know what God wants you to do It starts with, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Are you willing to turn it over to God and say, Lord, I want your will to be done? And when you've surrendered, then ask him to guide you and get into his word and seek him. Because the spirit of God will work in your heart through the word of God, when you're surrendered to him and you're seeking him in his word, he will work on you to create in you the desires that he wants you to have. For some of you right now, you're sitting here, some of you watching right now, all of a sudden, you're beginning to recognize this has been the voice of God. There's something going on in you Right now, it's been there for a long time. Maybe this desire that you couldn't explain and you've not been able to know, is this God or not? And God today is identifying and saying, it's me. Tested by the word. Tested by, does it have staying power? Tested by, does it grow more intense the closer you get to God? If so... And brothers and sisters, you've heard, you're hearing the voice of God. Jesus says, follow me. That's me. For some of you today, maybe you're not sure about whether you even have a relationship with God. You're not sure what would happen to you if you died today. You don't know where you're going to spend eternity, but you'd like to have a relationship with God. Maybe you have a desire to know God. Maybe you have a desire to, to be forgiven of your sins, a desire to be rid of the guilt and the shame of the mistakes you've made in your life, to have a brand new beginning, a brand new start in life. If that's true, if you have a desire, do you know that the Bible says that no one would seek after God on our own? 
Jesus, in fact, said, no one can come to me unless God the Father draws them to me. So if you're here today or you're watching right now and, and you have a desire to be right with God, you have a desire to be forgiven of your sins, you have a desire to have a home in heaven, eternal life, then that's, that's the work of God. That's God drawing you. That's him inviting you right now today to come to him. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. It's like your, your life has a, is like a room with a door on it. He says, I'm knocking. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will fellowship with him and he with me. Jesus said, your life is like got a door on it and I'm knocking. You can know it's him knocking if you have a desire today to be saved. You have a desire to be forgiven. That's him knocking. He said, if you hear my voice, you hear me, that's me. You hear me? Then all you got to do is open the door. <clears throat> Give me an indication that you want me to come into your life and I will do it. He'll do it right now. He'll do it right where you're sitting, right where you're watching right now. He's just waiting for you to invite him. So the Bible says that everyone who will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he's waiting for you right now. So if that's you today and you're ready, then pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I have disobeyed you a lot. And my disobedience, my sins have separated me from God. But I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. And I believe you rose from the dead. And you told me that if I would open the door, you said, I will come in. Your promise is that everyone who will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm calling right now, Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me from my sins. Make me a child of God. Give me eternal life, a brand new beginning. And from this day on, I will follow you. Thank you for hearing my prayer and giving me a brand new start. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, congratulations. Something wonderful just happened to you. You just became a brand new person. So many great things just happened to you. In fact, you're gonna spend the rest of your life learning about it, and you're going to spend the rest of eternity thanking God for it. And so, congratulations. And if you just prayed and asked Jesus to come into your life, you just got a brand new beginning in life. So now what? Now what do you do? How do you start following Him? Well, that's the purpose of a church, is to help you know how to do that. So today, if you prayed that prayer with me, if you would take the gray card that's in the seat back in front of you, fill that out. And check the box that says, today, I ask Jesus to save me from my sins. If you would drop that card in one of the offering boxes on either side of the doors as you make your way out, we'll contact you this week and we will just congratulate you and celebrate with you for a minute and thank God for that and then give you some practical advice on how you begin this new life that you're starting with Jesus. We'd love to do that. So I hope that you will fill that card out and turn it in today. Maybe you'd like to be baptized, or maybe you'd like to join our church. Then we're going to baptize in about a month, I think May 19th. If you've never been baptized since you gave your life to Jesus, then that is really about the first commandment Jesus gives us. So if you've never done that, then this is a great place to start. So take that gray card, check that box, baptism, or I want to become a member of the church, and drop it in the box, and we'll contact you this week. If you're our guest here today, thank you so much for coming.
appreciate so very much you being here. I hope when you came in today that you felt welcomed. I hope you sensed the presence of God here. I hope you heard from God and that service was a blessing to you. I also hope you'll come back because next week I'm going to continue this series, Hearing from the Living Lord, and give you another way or two that God speaks to us so that you can learn to recognize the voice of God. So I hope you'll come back and bring somebody with you. So if you're our guest today, if you don't mind filling out the blue card, this is the seat back in front of you, and if you'll drop that in the offering box. And then on the back tables, there's a book that I would love for you to pick up a copy of that book. It's just our gift to you as our guest for being here today. And take that home with you. I think it'd be a blessing to your life. And so thank you so much for coming.